Hello and welcome to the Big Freeze Art Festival. I'm Charlotte Connolly. I'm the museum curator at the Polar Museum and I'm really pleased today to be joined by John Kelly, who is an artist who's worked in both polar regions, both the Arctic and the Antarctic. So, John, perhaps you could tell us a little bit about how you came to work in the polar regions. Yeah, it really uh, starts about 2003 uh, when a, a chance meeting with uh, Sir Gavin Maxwell Davies, the uh, composer uh, at Brighton Festival. He'd just come back from the Antarctic with Bass, British Antarctic Survey. And uh, we had a drink together, and uh, as you do. And he uh, he said to me, he said, well, yeah, you've got, a, you've got a passion here with your landscape and things, because I've been talking about the work up to date. And he said, well, you know, have you considered the polar area? And I, well, yes, yeah. Um, a lot of my work uh, involves going into wildernesses um, in isolation and taking a particular interpretation of landscape with me which was fed on by teaching geography for many years so I have a sort of geomorphological part of the brain which clicks when I go into some of these areas so it was the ultimate challenge really it was you know the Antarctic first and foremost uh, and I think that um, set um, sort of the, the mark for the, the following what, decade or more, where I've had opportunities to get back into the polar areas. Because you know, once once you go to these polar areas, um, there's a tremendous pull to go to go back. And, uh, and historically, you know, people like Shackleton and, and Scott always wanted to go back uh, until eventually they, it would claim them. Uh, and it, it, it gets that hold on you. So I think that was the, the sort of obsessiveness almost once, you know, once I had a chance to see Sal. So in 2013 to 14, you were the Friends of Spry Antarctic Artist in Residence. Was that your first trip to the Polar Regions? Uh, no, no, the first was in 2003, 2004 with the Fellowship, uh, the British Antarctic Survey. Um, and just say briefly about that Fellowship, uh, it was a vision, uh, particularly of uh, the late David Walton, uh, the Emeritus Professor at, at Bass. Um, the idea of the artist scheme there uh, was to bring different disciplines into the Antarctic uh, and not simply have it for the scientists. Not that scientists, you know, uh, don't deserve, they've done tremendous work down there. Um, but David's idea really was to have artists, composers, writers, uh, all different disciplines to get uh, an impression of the Antarctic as it is and how important it is to relate that back to the public. Um, and I think you know, once you get people like uh, Maxwell Davies down there, it was interesting that when he went down, yes, he was collecting material for his Antarctic Symphony, uh, but he was also keeping a journal, you know, with sketches and notes and bits in it. And that comes to the point I made uh, a while ago regarding how it activates all your senses when you go into these areas, not, not purely visual, in fact, it was significant, really, that Bass uh, did not include photographers in their list of people going down because it's probably one of the most photographed places on Earth uh, and important to get at different sort of levels of interpretation of, of that particular region. So uh, it was a decade later then that you went on the Friends of Spry Artist in Residence uh scheme and that's a bit different because we work in partnership with the royal navy so that residency you're on board a royal naval patrol ship so can you tell us a bit about that yeah very interesting because uh, very much in contrast to the first visit down to the antarctic where i was land-based uh, in maritime antarctica for two months uh, and connecting with particularly the wildlife penguins and seals and skewers and albatross and you know that was a very different experience and a, a very important one but with the the spry um initiative uh, it allowed me to see a lot more of the antarctic by going down the peninsula uh, so it went further south than i'd been before uh, and it was it was a companion residency to the one i'd had with the norwegian polar research institute so the year before that going down with Spry on Protector. I was on the ship Lance, which went north to about 84 degrees north before it could find ice to attach itself to. And so it was, and I was traveling again with scientists on the research vessel. 
So it was nice to see a contrast uh, between the North and South uh, again, and uh, that formed the basis of the C book, uh, which I produce as a result of the Scott Bowler um, residency. So tell us a bit about some of those differences then between the North and the South. Do they have a, a different feel? What is it to you that you think characterizes them? When I give talks on uh, my, my, my work, I, I normally start with a, a, a split picture. And on the left of the picture, there's a picture of me with a gun, um, and that's in the north. And on the right is a picture of me with a penguin. And um, because a lot of people get the, the poles mixed up. Um, the, I find that the north, which is rich in myth uh, and uh, has a great darkness to it that the south doesn't really possess. Um, a colleague of mine, Peter Davidson, who wrote um, The Idea of North and uh, Last of the Light, uh, suggested, you know, if you're traveling on a motorway um, and you see those big blue signs, you know, the north and sometimes the south, if you look at the north sign, it gives you, a, it kind of sends you into a very different mindset than if you look at the south. The south always suggests kind of a, yes, a warmth, uh, but a softness or towards familiarity the north is a challenge to to go north and i've found that with the residences i've had in the north and i've had quite a few um that it's uh, that myth and, and and feeling of unease um is is very strong uh in finland they talk of uh, pitta anara which translates basically to keeping the twilight and for people of the north, the twilight is a very important time of the day or time of the season because they have a very long twilight period. And it's a very special period. I mean, we've all looked at the sunset and we've all kind of been aware of the light fading and we really want to oh, we'd like it to stay a bit longer. But it, eventually it's going to go and there's going to be darkness that follows. And for people in the north, that can be a you know, three month darkness you know, with no more sun. And so for them, uh, it heightens their sensitivity, as it were, to that, that period. So there's a big difference. The South, um, I always you know, think of dingle days in the South when the, the ice is hanging in the air in the little droplets and it sparkles and it's, it's one of the most fantastic places to be. But there's also you know, days that we call mank days down there on the land when uh, you simply get this thick mist and it's cold and it, you really do feel at the end of the earth with that. Mm -hmm. Feels like quite a northern hemisphere person type of a, a distinction between the two. And of course, as an artist, you're taking some of yourself to these sites as well as um, yeah. just being a kind of passive receptacle for all of the things that you're encountering. Yeah, I mean, with the um, um, residency I had at uh, the area of Barrow, Point Barrow in Alaska, I stayed and worked with the Inupiat people up there. Um, they still hunt the whale and uh, you know, a lot of their traditions are, st are still there, but they are fading. And, uh, and it's that which has sort of helped me to inform me on the new work on the Northland uh, because of the changes to climate and the loss of, sort of basically environmental degradation which takes place, that these cultures are at risk. So that's also come into the work a bit. Okay, um, we'll, we'll talk about your Northland work in a minute, but just for the folks at home, it's worth mentioning that we have got an Anupiat artist, Art Umatuk, who we're hoping to be inviting to participate in the festival as well. So if anyone's interested in finding out a bit more about those traditions, then that's a really good one to look out for. Um, so moving on to the Northland piece, we've got that up on the screen here, and this is part of a series of work, I understand. So tell us a bit more about that. Yeah, the uh, Northland, um, journeys into the twilight um, really concerned me during the last five years. I've been sort of building it together. It is very different from the earlier work. Um, due south, I produced uh, with the first visit to Antarctica and the sea book, um, tended to describe and chronicle the travels that I did. And it was this in mind because of the, the first show at the Natural History Museum, that it was about the, the Antarctic. So people wanted to know about the Antarctic and they wanted to know what it was like to actually be there. Uh, 
So that approach uh, sustained me for about a decade uh, when you know I developed the forensic works and uh, more recently uh, this work of Northland is imaginative um, in the sense that it uses uh, many of the experiences I've had in the past, also many of the photographic images I've had. And photo montage, which is what in fact uh, this work is, is a photo montage. The landscape you see does not exist. Uh, it's only in my mind. Uh, and it's one of 24 uh, photo montages which describe the journey of a, a chap by the name of Umitar, uh, who was Chinese, and he went on a Russian expedition this was in the 17th century, and it was chronicled by um, the scholar, Chinese scholar, Wang Mei. Uh, the expedition didn't really exist, of course, any more than anything else. But it, it, it was a, because the appeal of the North and its dark, dark ways, um, it, a lot of myth has been put into it and a lot of stories and storylines are important to my work. They always have been, but it's coming out more with this new work. Um, that journey to the north and Northland also includes a, a moon book, which I've been keeping, um, of an imaginary journey to the north, but a lot of it based on my own sort of thoughts and experiences. And you know, I write quite a lot, so you know, I, I kind of knit together this um, this new work, uh, mainly. Uh, black and white, you know, I, I'm not a great colorist. Uh, you know, I tend to keep to this and therefore a lot of these photo montages look as if they're run or produced with a night sky, but you have with the snow and you know, you have a light and a certain amount of light from the moon and that's where the moon book comes in. So this work, and I'm taking it to Trinity College in Dublin, where I'll be um, eventually uh, putting on a, an event there and looking at the study of twilight and the study of s the sublime in landscape. And of course, where better than Trinity College in Dublin with the, the home where, where Edmund Burke uh, produced his work on the sublime and the beautiful. Uh, so yes, this, this new work uh, will eventually, hopefully, when we move on to a, a new world of ours, uh, come out into the public domain. Fantastic. I find myself struck that you've retreated into this slightly imaginary world. Is that a response to lockdown and being in, we're in the middle of, of course, the COVID pandemic at the moment. Do you think you'd have produced this work in the same way had you been able to be more mobile? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, because the re its roots were go back well before the pandemic. Uh, the pandemic really, I suppose, is, is reinforced my belief in it more, mm -hmm. uh, that we do, you know, we take the world within us you know, whatever happens to it, you know, we'll, we'll hold ourselves together and keep that mental grasp on, you know, what was life before the pandemic and what life's going to be like after the pandemic. Um, so, yeah, it's, uh, it's firmly there. Um, I forget the question now, Charlotte, was it? <laughs> <laughs> I was just asking, do you think you would have produced the work in the same way if you'd have been able to be mobile in the way we were before the pandemic? Yeah, I think, yeah, the, this change of mine over the last five years is to, you know, the, when you're facing the reality of the fact that you may not be able to get back to Antarctica or, you know, the, the opportunities for going to the north, you know, you're, you're an aging artist, you know, you kind of think, well, you know, there's not going to be that many opportunities, although I've got some already lined up to get back to the north. Uh, the south is harder to get to, as you know. Um, but, uh, yeah, I'm conscious of the fact that this is more studio based. Uh, as opposed to me in the field, um, which is something I dearly love, but I, you know, it won't, may not always be practical. Sure. Well, thank you very much for telling us a bit about your work and your new work, and we'll look forward to seeing what comes out of your future journeys to the north and hopefully the south as well. <laughs> yeah, thank you, Sean. Thanks very much then. Bye-bye. Bye now.